Hello. How are we doing? Good morning. Wow. Good morning to one and all. How's everybody doing out there? You all okay? All right. Thank you so much. We got to do that. Yeah. Um, let me start by introducing myself and the lovely lady to my right. I'm Owsley Brown, for those of you I have not met, and I think some of you may be here for the first time uh, for this festival, and we are so glad you're here. We want to welcome uh, one and all and um, say, as I have said uh, hopefully every time, without you, we have no festival. So uh, give yourself a round of applause, and thank you all so much for being here. This year's festival, as I'm sure you all know uh, already, uh, is called Sacred Silence Pathway to Compassion. And uh, Gray Henry and, and myself have done our best uh, with uh, an incredible team behind us uh, and all around us uh, to put together a program that would speak to the relationship between silence and compassion and uh, with a specific eye on the extraordinarily uh, blessed thing that's going to happen here day after tomorrow, which is the arrival for uh, a remarkable three-day visit by His Holiness the Dalai Lama that I know all of you are, are surely uh, eagerly awaiting, as are we. Today's program uh, is an attempt to talk about uh, several different things in that silence and compassion territory, um, but among them would be the science of silence is maybe one way we could say it, uh, and its relationship to the brain and how that relates to who we are and what we do. Uh, um, and, and then also um, the, 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 the maybe the, the deeper side of all of that as it relates to uh, uh, a spiritual life. Um, but before we introduce our speakers, let me just um, reiterate what many of you have already heard, but which is just an essential uh, point to to make, which is uh, the, the 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 names of those people uh, within our community who have been so supportive and without whom we couldn't put on this festival. So let me start by just uh, mentioning the companies and organizations uh, that have been our uh, our sponsors of this year, starting with Brown Foreman, the city of Louisville, and our extraordinary mayor, Greg Fisher, who I am very happy to say is among us this morning in the front row. Let me stop what I'm saying and welcome you, Mr. Mayor, and tell you how honored we are that you're here. That's the greatest guy right there. You all, and I, I, there's so much to say about him, I will not get sidetracked, but let me just uh, include that he, without him, we wouldn't be doing this festival because it was at his request that we that we're doing it. But uh, continuing our thanks, we want to mention uh, our great appreciation to the Archdiocese of Louisville, the Earth and Spirit Center, uh, the marvelous Muhammad Ali Center, Louisville Public Media, DGI, the Thomas Merton Center, Fons Vitae, Compassionate Louisville, the Idea Festival, Val Jones and the Whiskey Row Lofts. We have an amazing uh, uh, exhibition of photographs of Thomas Merton uh, at Val's uh, gallery. Uh, and uh, Christy Brown for her enduring and, and I did Brown Foreman, yeah, I got them, uh, her uh, en enduring and unwavering support. Um, in our office, we have uh, an incredible team uh, uh, led by three individuals principally, including our executive director, who you might have seen this morning, Dr. Ka Dr. Kathleen Lyons, uh, uh, along with Chris Wooten and the intrepid uh, and extraordinary Sarah Reed Harris. Um, yes, they deserve your applause too. Yeah. Um, and I think I am now going to turn it over to my uh, incredible ally and, and cohort, Gray Henry, and you'll read uh, a couple of bios, say a few and things, and I'll come back. And, then you do Matthew. and I'll do Matthew. Okay, great. <clears throat> Good morning. Well, this morning we have with us uh, Dr. James Doty from Stanford University. It's amazing. I mean, the, His Holiness gave him, gave him $200,000 for Stanford to make a study of this incredible relationship between the brain and compassion. And James was with us here last uh, um, November for the other festival, and so it's thrilling to have him back. And then also we have Jonathan Bastian, who is with NPR the National Public Radio here in Louisville, who will be moderating. And Jonathan's 
I was about to say claim to fame, but he, he, he um, used to be a next door neighbor of the Louisvillian Hunter Thompson, who was out, and my husband Neville Blakemore used to shoot out light bulbs in the alleys with Hunter as a child, so we're all together. So let, let Owsley um, introduce um, Matthew. Yeah, oh, the connections are just great. They never end, do they? How amazing. <laughs> Even Hunter Thompson is with us tonight, or today. Here we are. Yay, Hunter. Okay. Um, we, I am so honored to uh, have the chance to introduce Machu Ricard, who uh, uh, I am thrilled to say is here not for his first time. Machu came, some of you may remember, uh, to a smaller audience, but now surely his third visit will have a much larger audience still. See, Machu, we're on a roll here in Louisville wherever you are. Um, Machu um, is a, a Buddhist monk who went from a scientific career as a molecular biologist uh, in France at the Institut Pasteur uh, to study uh, Buddhism in the Himalayas 40 years ago. He's the author of many books, including The Monk and the Philosopher, which he wrote with his father, Jean-François Jean Ravel, one of the most revered um, French philosophers, um, called Happiness. Uh, no, then he wrote another book. Sorry, that was not the book he wrote. Monk and the Philosopher he wrote with his father, and then another book he wrote uh, called Happiness, A Guide to Developing Life's Most Important Skills, and Why Meditate, and then yet another book, which he just finished, as he told me with a big smile on his face this morning at breakfast, last night here in Louisville. Can you imagine? He finished his next book right here in our town. How cool is that? Uh, he... Um, uh, has been a participant in the scientific research on the effects of meditation on the brain, working with the amazing Mind and Life Institute. For those of you that don't know about Mind and Life, and surely many of you do, but take note and go to their website and see what they're up to, and you'll connect a lot of what you're hearing today with respect to uh, this, this morning's talk. Uh, he's been a French interpreter uh, uh, for the Dalai Lama since 1989, and he lives in Nepal and donates all the proceeds of his books and conferences to Karuna Sachin, a humanitarian organization that he founded in 2001. Uh, please join Gray and me in welcoming our speakers to the stage. Well, you want to sit on my lap? <laughs> <laughs> okay, please. Yes, oh. We have nice chairs here in Louisville. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, perhaps if there's any NPR listeners, maybe some of us spend our mornings together as I host Morning Edition. It's been a pleasure over these last weeks to bring some of these voices onto our airwaves. Matthew, a few weeks ago we had a great conversation and uh, that dialogue with Festival of Faiths, thanks to Owsley and so many people, has been so tremendous for WFPL and to bring it, these voices onto really your public radio station here, so welcome. Um, to give you a sense of how this is gonna unfold, because I know we have a lot to do today and we wanna make sure we get through all of it. I've been asked to be a loyal timekeeper as well today, but we will begin, as we do beautifully for all of these events, with three minutes of silence, which Mathieu will lead followed by James will give a presentation, Mathieu will give a presentation, then we'll come back together here and begin a conversation and a dialogue, the three of us. But please have your questions prepared because I know we want to hear from you a lot in this conversation. So that being said, Mathieu, will you please lead us? Okay. So um, I think as traditional for this festival, we'll begin by two minutes of silence. So, since uh, Jim and, and myself, we are going to share uh, some thoughts and research about compassion, uh, let's uh, dedicate these three minutes of silence to see how, what comes out spontaneously out of a pure silence of simplicity when the mind is uh, free from those mental construct, from those strange mental obscuration that sometimes give rise to aggressivity, craving, jealousy. When the mind remains in that sheer simplicity of silence, then what comes out of it, if not compassion? 
and loving kindness. So let's see within that silence, from the very depth of that silence, what comes out of it. And let's hope it's compassion. Thank you, Matthew. Now, James, welcome to the stage, and we look forward to your presentation. Wonderful. I don't know about you guys, but uh, the more we learn about electronics, the more difficult it is uh, to function. So I have no doubt that something will happen here. To my dismay. Okay. So do I need to do something to put this on the screen? The See, I told you, didn't I tell you? That's well, we're nice figuring that out. Maybe I did something here, so let me check. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is what I was waiting for. <laughs> Insight. It's interesting. Uh, uh, I was with the mayor the other day, and he was informing me some very interesting facts about Louisville. And I, I've actually been in your lovely city before. Oh, we have another person coming. <laughs> it takes a village, uh, actually, to do this stuff. Uh, actually, so I was talking to the mayor, and he was giving a talk. And, uh, it was interesting, uh, he was informing me that Louisville was rated the manliest city in America. <laughs> and I found that really quite interesting because it's also a compassionate city. And, 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 and you know, maybe we're at a new age where you can be manly and be compassionate at the same time. And I think, in some, right? <laughs> I, I have to tell you, I think we should give an award to uh, Greg for being the manliest, most compassionate mayor. <laughs> so, so. I can never figure these things out. Well, really, it really is a pleasure to be with you today. And I'm going to, uh, what my talk is really going to focus on is to try to give you a story about uh, how we evolved and then connect it to actually brain function, actually our heart, and uh, ultimately the value proposition of being compassionate. Uh, this is a picture actually of my son. 
uh, who uh, really had the pleasure and joy of being with His Holiness, and it's really quite a remarkable uh, picture, and uh, I put it on my phone to remind me not only of my son, but uh, His Holiness. And it's interesting, he said some time ago, if you wish to make others happy, practice compassion. If you wish to be happy, practice compassion. And now we have the science actually to support that statement, uh, absolutely. So as Gray uh, indicated, uh, I'm a, uh, actually a professor of neurosurgery at Stanford and uh, had really the honor of meeting His Holiness uh, following some initial work I had done on uh, actually the neuroscience of compassion. And at that first meeting, His Holiness gave the spontaneous donation uh, uh, which was at that time the highest sum he had ever given to a non-Tibetan cause for this work at Stanford. And the center was created, which is called the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. It's sort of interesting, because sometimes people don't think of neurosurgeons as being compassionate, and uh, you're probably correct. Uh, and, and, and sometimes when we talk about Stanford, uh, the concept of compassion uh, isn't always there because it's a fairly competitive environment. But you know, what we're finding is that you can be competitive, but you can be actually competitive for the good of all. And that's really uh, an important concept. You know, compassion, uh, as scientists define it, is the uh, recognition of another's suffering with a desire to intervene. And there's a whole process of brain function that is associated with that. It's funny because people talk about evolution, and oftentimes they'll say, well, you know, it's survival of the fittest. It's survival of the most ruthless. It's survival of the most competitive. But really, Darwin actually never said this. What happened was that Herbert uh, Spencer, who was a philosopher, had made some comments about an economic theory and said survival of the fittest, and then it got distorted in this way. This is what actually Darwin actually said. It is, uh, Darwin argued that sympathy will have been increased through natural selection. And for those communities, which include the greatest number of most sympathetic individuals, meaning kind uh, individuals, would flourish the best and rear the greatest number of offspring. And it's interesting because this has now been proven out by scientists. In fact, if you look at group behavior as an example in bonobos, which is a type of primate, uh, it has been shown that while you can get short-term gain from being ruthless, long-term survival of a species ultimately relies on that species being cooperative and actually compassionate. This relates to evolution in the sense that for our, our species to have evolved, it required actually, and to evolve to who we are, which is a, a species that uh, has developed something called theory of mind, where we recognize that another person exists and, and, and uh, talks to us and relates to us. We have abstract language, excuse me, complex language and abstract thinking. But the price of that required a prolonged gestational period, a small litter, and the requirement fundamentally that the offspring had to be reared. And some of you, we, you know, we think about maybe 15 years. Some of you, it's probably 30 years that you have to take care of your offspring or longer, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I know the feeling myself, believe me. Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, the reality is, though, that because to the mother or to the parents, the cost of, that, of taking care of that child, you weren't receiving much. I mean, it took energy, it took work, it took effort. And uh, fundamentally, unlike other species where they come out of the womb and they just run away, you had to be there. So there had to be a mechanism derived that would connect the mother to this very strong bond to uh, uh, take care of the offspring. And fundamentally, that is the process through by which uh, compassion, nurturing, caring developed and is so important to our species and our lives if we were to flourish. Um, the other thing that's interesting though is as a process of this evolution, unfortunately, uh, and I'll say if you believe in evolution, uh, unfortunately the process of evolution sometimes, it doesn't make it perfect, it makes it good enough, right? And in this process also you carry parts that you may wish you've, you've gotten rid of and there's a part of our brain called the reptilian brain that uh, as a result has stayed with us and is associated with this fight and flight response which uh, I'll talk about in a little bit, still affects us and has a profound effect on how we function and in fact our health in this modern world. 
So uh, we were evolved to uh, survive. And here's some examples, and I hope you appreciate the last one. This was given to me by a friend of mine from San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> that's me over in the... Uh, no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you look at this, this process of bonding and nurturing, uh, one example, and it's not, uh, of course, only associated with humans, it's in many species, it's, I would say, I would like to say it's highest evolved in humans, but sometimes with I, when I look at the world, I sometimes wonder if that's really true. But in the context of prairie voles, uh, one of the mechanisms which have been derived to promote this affiliative bonding or caring is a hormone, and it's not the only hormone, but a major hormone is called oxytocin, and it's the bonding hormone. And in a subset of voles, prairie voles, it has been found that this is a monogamous coupling. They're very caring about their family. Uh, but uh, if you look at some other examples, and maybe I didn't have it here, but what happens though is, so we know this is the case. And in fact, there's another species of voles that is not monogamous, and, and the male partner actually is quite um, a philanderer. Uh, but <laughs> if you look, at, as we've started to learn about this process of nurturing and what is involved in this, we have found, uh, and I say we, this is a group of scientists, not me actually, but it has been found that there are receptors uh, that can affect how oxytocin is, uh, it, the effect it will have. And in fact, we have found that there are some people with a particular type of uh, oxytocin receptor who actually are much more caring, affiliative, uh, uh, want to connect with people, while some people without this uh, particular type of receptor or a different type of receptor are not that way at all. In fact, they're a reserve, they're contained, they don't naturally get along with people. So it is evident that there is a genetic component to actually caring and bonding. But what's interesting is, even though there's a genetic component, it doesn't mean that you cannot potentiate your own compassion. Because while there's a ge genetic component and a range, frankly, most of us are at the lower range. We can actually, and we'll talk about some of the techniques that can bring us to the upper range and why we should perhaps do that. So uh, chronic illness is associated with this unhealthy overexpression of immune cells, causing excess pro-inflammatory response in those individuals who do not have this particular gene. And if I can. So here's some aspects of this, pro this connection system, if you will, or this bonding system. Part of it is something called, many of you may have heard of these mirror neurons, where we mirror behavior in others. It allows us to learn, it allows us to connect, and it's a very important part of our ability to connect with those who are close to us. And, in, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, and I think Mathieu will also talk about uh, in-group and out-group connecting. Another aspect is, you know, there have been studies actually done, and this is one, where uh, they were surveyed, men and women, about what's the most important thing in a partner. Now, what would men say, do you think? Looks, right? Is that true, guys? No. Uh, uh, and, and what do women want? Well, maybe I shouldn't ask in a public forum. Uh, <laughs> women. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about the women who read Cosmopolitan, OK? Uh, uh, what women actually want is a partner who can provide for them, and that's how we've been genetically uh, tuned, if you will. But what's amazing is, though, that outweighs any of that, both in males and females, when they look for a partner, when they've done these surveys, is a partner who is kind and caring. And uh, I mentioned uh, the study whereby and it has been shown by Dr. Sapolsky and others, but he's a professor at Stanford, who has done these studies in primates, that in fact has shown that those who display cooperative behavior and caring within their group, uh, compared to other similar types of groups, uh, survive much better, longer, and actually incre increase their population. Here's the consequence of, if you will, 
lack of compassion in an individual's life. And I'm sure you can play this out in, in events that have occurred in your own life, but here the health uh, uh, associations in children who have not been raised up in an environment of caring or, if you will, attachment. And look at all the health conditions which are profoundly increased in these individuals who do not have secure attachment and connection. Look at the levels of depression, anxiety, alcohol, and substance abuse. So we clearly know that is absolutely critical, both in development of children and as adults, in, in regard to our health, that we demonstrate compassion. So what is compassion? It's a very complex sequence of events. First, you actually have to engage meaning that you have to see an event happening, let's say a person suffering, and you actually have to see it and respond to it. You also have, and this is this, where this reptilian brain or threat uh, response occurs, or the flight or fight response, because you have to sit there and then say, well, am I gonna be potentially hurt if I get involved, or is it gonna cost me on some other level? And after that, you have to see yourself as potentially able to help. And then this is where this system of affiliative or bonding behavior or nurturing system comes in. And then you also have to sit there and say, they're like me, I want to engage. And then once you actually have this desire to engage or desire to respond, and I'll show this in some other slides, amazingly, those centers in your brain that are associated with pleasure are activated. In fact, it is shown it is pleasurable actually when you care for others. And that pleasure has an effect ultimately on yourself. And this is the same area in the brain, believe it or not, that responds to pleasure associated with food, pleasure associated with sex, and what has been a derivative of our evolution is pleasure associated with the uh, attaining of money actually. Uh, so, we have, over the last decade, through the Mind and Life Institute, of which I'm a uh, fellow, and in fact, Matu and I were recently with His Holiness in India, uh, actually training monks in neuroscience. And you see his picture over there on the left with that beautiful looking cap and Dr. Richie Davidson, and there I am having this deep discussion uh, with His Holiness. I think he was chastising me something about something I can't remember. Uh, but uh, <laughs> again, His Holiness has made many profound statements. And again, that have been shown absolutely correct in regard to the actual brain science. And His Holiness has been interested in brain science for well over two decades and has actually been the promoter of this interaction between neuroscientists for many years. And <clears throat> uh, that is the origin actually of the Mind and Life Institute. Uh, on the picture on the left, it's interesting. You see Machu there in that lovely hat. And that was um, a mechanism to uh, measure brain waves. And when uh, Richie Davidson actually first went to India to work with His Holiness and some monks, they had informed them that they wanted to study uh, compassion in the brain. And they pulled out this head thing there, and they showed it to the monks, and they all started laughing when the scientists put it on. And the scientists, of course, uh, in their typical hubris, assumed it, well, it's because it looked funny, those guys really don't know what's going on, and I'll have to explain this because I'm from the modern world and they're from the primitive world. Uh, um, have you ever seen people with arrogance uh, before? <laughs> You'll find it in scientists. You'll also find it especially in neurosurgeons. Uh, but but uh, what was extraordinary is, after the, you know, the scientists sat there and made this assumption, and then one of the monks spoke up and he said, you know, the reason we're laughing isn't because of that. The reason we're laughing is because compassion is not here. Compassion is here. And in fact, science has also proven that to be the case. And in fact, that connection between your heart and your brain is quite profound. There's a representation in our heart that, and other organs in the body, but especially in our heart, that is associated with this flight or fight response. And in fact, that was a great mechanism when we survived on the prairie, or the savanna, if you will, in Africa, and we were approached by a lion. And what would happen? We would suddenly 
uh, run away and these hormones would kick in. Our, our immune system would be uh, supported, our, our cortisol levels would go up, our epinephrine and norepinephrine would allow us to run really fast and hopefully we made it to that tree and escaped death. And if we didn't, it probably didn't matter, right? But the thing is that same mechanism though still exists in us today. And what has happened is there is an imbalance in many people in modern society between what we would call, uh, or what is called the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is that system which allows us to relax, allows us to be calm, allows us, if you will, to, to be at our best, to flourish, and it, and it really promotes this connection. Because at that point, when your parasympathetic nervous system is best engaged, that's when you're most relaxed and can really exhibit what it is to be a human. But unfortunately, in modern society, there's a sense, because we have so many things hitting us and so many things going on and we're always distracted because in some ways, what is happening to us, and we're the only species that has this, a memory of a past, so what happens to people, they, they have regrets about the past, so they're, they're sitting there, or they have anxiety about the future, and they're not here. Because if you're here, you're relaxed, contained, and this is the only moment we have together. But because of these distractions, this autonomic nervous system is imbalanced where the sympathetic system kicks in, and many people have this constant release of cortisol, epinephrine, and other hormones that on a short term are very advantageous to our survival, but on the long term are incredibly, self or incredibly destructive and are associated with a uh, high frequency of cardiac death, effects on your peripheral nervous system, uh, uh, effects on your mental functioning associated with depression, anxiety, and which cause you not to function at your best. But there's good news. Uh, there have been a number of techniques developed over the, the last few decades that have allowed us to actually control our autonomic nervous system to promote balance and to promote increased tone of our parasympathetic nervous system. And one of the most popular, uh, and which a lot of you probably know about, is a technique based on a meditation practice uh, that has been secularized, if you will. Uh, and it's an eight-week program, and it's called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. And it has had a huge impact, because by bringing your system into balance, uh, chronic pain, stress levels have been shown to dramatically decrease and it promotes the immune system. So this is an intervention, in it, if you will, and a multiple labs uh, at Madison in Wisconsin, at uh, Emory uh, in uh, Atlanta, at Stanford, we have developed programs based on this to promote this type of behavior while also promoting uh, a deeper sense of compassion, not only for yourself, but for others, and self-compassion is a very important component. So these types of systems and what contemplative practice, if you will, or these types of mind training practices allow you to do are to increase the tone of your parasympathetic nervous system. It allows you faster recovery from uh, normal stresses in life, increases your sense of positivity about who you are and how you relate in the world and how you connect with others, and improves your social orientation to connect with others. And here's a, 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 another uh, monk, uh, Barry Curzon, who's a friend of mine, he's also a physician. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about brain effects of uh, compassion training, actually, if you will. And what happens is there's different parts of the brain that respond during this process, which I mentioned, of uh, b being compassionate to another. Uh, one of the areas associated with empathy when we take on the suffering of another and we really connect with them is the anterior posterior medial cortex. And then uh, we get this stress-related amygdala ac ac activation, the sympathetic nervous system engaged, and glucocorticoid activity increasing. And then uh, the next is this nurturing orientation occurs and then the sense that we're connected and we want to care for somebody. And finally, at the end of it, the sense of joy and pleasure about that interaction. And here's a study that uh, was done at Stanford, which interestingly shows that 
uh, you can demonstrate to individuals, uh, you can give them a subliminal view of a picture, uh, and it's talking about something called the warm glow, that may show a happy face or a sad face, but they can't see this when you actually give it to them. But if you prep them, if you will, and then show them other pictures of art, which, like this is an example, depending on how you prep them, they will sit there and say they have a warm feeling associated with that art. Although on a subliminal level, they saw this picture of happiness or kind person. Well, if you show them a negative person, they will tell you that that picture is ugly, which as I think it actually is. Uh, so, but it's interesting how each of us can be affected if we are prepped in the right way. <clears throat> there is another concept called common humanity, the ability to connect with and see yourself as part of a whole and that others are like you. And studies have been done whereby if you see, and this on the right is a demonstration of a hand, if you see it like being cut with a knife, you actually, and this gets to this mirror neuron effect, you feel as if you're being cut and you don't want that to happen and you will demonstrate this, this effect and how your physiologic, ph physiology responds to this. But this is only works with this idea of your in-group. You know, prior to 5,000 years ago, there were no cities. Prior to 10,000 years ago, the major survival strategy of our species was as hunter-gatherers and we lived in groups of 10 to 50. And it was very important that everybody cooperated, connected, and supported each other. And actually, we revolve, evolved that way so that we define in-groups. So if in this study, you have this in, if this person is in your in-group or somebody you care about, you respond appropriately because, oh, I don't want them to be hurt. I don't want to be hurt. But interestingly enough, here's another study that was done in Italy. And this was people who had received uh, uh, AIDS through transfusion versus AIDS through IV drug abuse. And what the study showed is that if they acquired AIDS through a blood transfusion, no fault of their own, if you will, actually people felt much more sympathetic and connected. But if it was through IV drug abuse, which was a view, viewed as something they brought on themselves, they're not like me, they're not good people, you did not have the same degree of empathic or caring response. And here's our dear friend here, looking at his best, Mathieu. And uh, uh, he's one of these individuals who's spent well over 10,000 hours in deep compassion type of meditation. And he is actually able to control his brain function to a point where you could ask him, like if we were to look at an MRI and you said, Mathieu, take on the suffering of another. And those areas I talked about, he will, that will light up. He has that much control. And then if you say, well, modulate it to 30% or 60%, he's actually able to do that amazingly enough. Now, I'm not saying you have to do 10,000 hours and be Mathieu Ricard to be compassionate because you don't. But this is showing you the ability of mind training to have an effect on your brain and your life and ultimately how you flourish in this world. So we know based on these types of trainings, as example, a loving kindness meditation increases positive emotion and is associated with less depression. It increases social connectedness and it improves your attention. And in fact, amazingly, there's been a study done on those over the age of 65 that showed that when individuals volunteered, or if you will, cared for others, that their longevity increased twofold. Can you imagine? But with a couple exceptions. In the surveys, if the person said, I'm doing this because it'll make me look good to my friend, right? Or, or I'm doing this because I get something out of it, they didn't demonstrate the effect. It is only with authentic caring and connecting that you receive the benefits of being compassionate. And those benefits are myriad in terms of cardiac health, mental health, and general health. Here's another study uh, training focused on compassion specifically. And what it shows is that among those who are trained, they're much more receptive when they hear the suffering of another versus those who are not trained. Again, increasing their compassion and their desire to connect. 
Here's another study, which was a uh, program we did at Stanford based on a, uh, uh, an intervention with a group of students and controls and how they responded to a person who was a prisoner and, and actually had murdered somebody and uh, that connection. And while following the uh, compassion training, what happened was that they felt more that they could sympathize with the individual, but they did not forgive the individual, but it created a much more openness versus a condemnation. You know, in our system in America, what type of a system do we have for prisoners? It is not a redemptive program. It is a retributive program. And you know, the sad thing is that in our prison system today, do you really believe that most of the people there are evil? I will assure you, based on my own experience and others, the people, the majority of people in prison are not bad people. They're actually people who've not had love care and compassion in their lives. And all of these people can be redeemed. And James, and not too many. Okay, I'll be there. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, these types of practice lead to healthier coping skills, greater self-reported uh, care, and uh, much more compassion to others and also to oneself. Here's a study demonstrate, demonstrating how the immune system is promoted and how cortisol levels are decreased with compassion interventions. This is demonstrating how when someone actually intervenes, these parts of the brain, our caudate nucleus, our nucleus accumbens, actually light up, increase metabolism actually when you're caring for another people. This is where people get their greatest and longest, deepest sense of satisfaction serving others. And here's another study that we did at uh, Stanford related to actually giving individuals monies to donate or keep, or we made them donate. And what's interesting is when they donated, they actually, their, their brain centers for pleasure lit up, but when we force them to donate the money even to others, it's still lit up. And it shows you that actually even if you're just watching the event of caring for another or doing something for another, you get fulfillment. And this is a, a study that it's, without getting too complicated, it shows that when individuals actually give more or, or give and see the effect of it, they actually give more. Again, supporting the idea of caring and the value of connecting. Uh, I'm just gonna run through, uh, I'll forget that one, but this is an interesting slide. This is some work we're doing at Stanford on a rat model, uh, deconstructing the nurturing pathways. And uh, actually, uh, what we're able to do is turn it on and off genes of nurturing, believe it or not, and have them affected by certain wavelengths of light. And in this example, uh, I think it's there. In this example, what happened is, like if we were to take a male rodent and we uh, let him do his natural thing, if we put an intruder in his cage, he will, of course, react violently like most men do when their territory is invaded. But if we actually stimulate his nurturing and bonding pathways, he actually starts sniffing around the private parts of this individual, which is a sign that he's allowing him to be in it and, and sort of connecting with him. And the other thing is, on a female, if we do it, the natural tendency for a female with children or a litter is to care for it. If we actually turn off the nurturing system by using a different wavelength of life, she'll abandon the children. So it shows you the power of these nurturing bonding pathways. So compassion-like happiness is a has a genetic compo component. We have demonstrated that you can reset it with training. Gene expression can affect how w one's ability uh, to, if you will, be compassionate. We know that, per that mental training can have permanent lasting effects and uh, that by being more compassionate, you actually decrease your stress. And one of the key components and one of the hardest things to do, and that will ultimately actually allow for the survival of our species is by increasing your ring, if you will, or circle of compassion, recognizing that everyone in this world wants the same thing that you do. And it may be called in different terms, but at the end of the day, we all want happiness. We all want to be connected. And uh, in fact, this is uh, the process whereby you expand like circles and uh, ripples in a, a pond are these connections to others so that you have a view of the world as shared humanity and oneness. 
Happiness cannot come from out without, it must come from within. It is not what we see and touch, what others do for us that makes us happy. It is that which we think and feel and do, first for others and then ourselves. And this also is similar to peace in the world cannot happen unless we have peace within ourselves. Thank you. So thank you, James, Jim, for this wonderful presentation. And um, I cannot be uh, but struck by a coincidence. Yesterday morning, as, uh, after leaving Madison, where we spent two wonderful days with His Honest Dalai Lama, at the airport, I saw a quite impressive person coming. And he introduced himself as John Francis. And he said that, uh, well, we talked. He said he was a friend of Richard Davidson. And he said, you know, when I was 27, I was so upset by the Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill. Uh, and it, because in my community, it was a small village of 250 people, nobody was caring. So he said that as a sort of protest, he decided to walk around the village and be silent for one day. And then he thought, this seems to be quite interesting. So he did another day and another day. And he ended up doing 17 years of silence. And since at the same time for that one day he said he won't ride a car, he, he walked for 23 years across the United States. In the meantime, he managed to get a PhD without speaking. So quite a remarkable guy. So that shows the power of silence. Still, you can do things. Now he speaks, fortunately. And it's a great guy. It's a TED talk that is fascinating that I saw last night. So this is a good place of silence, as you can see. Not much distraction, not too many supermarkets. So there's nothing much to do except remain in silence and let compassion grow from within. So why would you grow compassion in silence and for what purpose? Well, if you want to serve others, you know, it's like without sort of beginning by transforming oneself, it's a little bit like a, a beggar that wants to give a banquet to 100 person and doesn't have the right provision. So myself, having been now in the humanitarian world for a number of years, I see all the time that the, the grains of sand that bring to an alt a beautiful project meant to help others are corruption, conflicts of ego, in short, human shortcomings. So it seems that to begin by gathering from within the inner strength, the courage, the determination, the compassion, the fact that you don't care about what people might say or not say, praise and blame, gain and loss, and you are completely determined to be at the service of others. This is a skill that needs to be built. Spend some time in silence like a wounded deer who hides in the forest for the time of getting strong, and then you can run around in the world. So we need this time of silence to build up altruism and compassion. So why would we need so much altruism and compassion in our world? Well, if we look at the main challenges that we are facing today, one of those challenges is it's very hard to reconcile, even in our mind, three time scale. People tell us about the emergency of the ec economic situation. Now the stock market goes up and down within a few days. You don't know why. Nobody knows, seems to know why in a way. So this is a very fast sort of speed changed. And the people say, that's reality. You have to take care of that. Otherwise, everything else will go to the drain. But then there's the quality of life. There is flourishing. There is the time span of a, of a family, of a generation, of a career, of a lifetime. And that's 
the well-being that you experience moment after moment, and also over the span of your life when you look at it, was it fulfilling? Was it worth living for oneself and for others? And then there's the longer time scale of the environment, which is, of course, now it's shrinking down, but still, it is much longer. So, you know, it's very easy to say, well, let's see what happens. You know, if you say that things will change, everything will change, we are going to a catastrophe in 50 years, and people say, well, come back after 49 years, we'll see. You know, I'm a Marxist, but of the Groucho tendency. <laughs> what Groucho said, why should I care for future generations? What did they do for me? <laughs> so that's what the economists are saying today, basically. You know, they can't put that in their balance sheet. You know, next generation, that's too long. So there is a real problem here, because even we have a strong well-being now, and if everything is a catastrophe after, well, it doesn't show up. So what will be the only single concept that seamlessly unify those three timescales and allow for some thinking, for some action, for some long-term vision? It is having more consideration for others. That's the only concept that works. If you have more consideration of, for others, you are not going to play like at the casino with the with savings that people who trusted you in the financial world. If you have more consideration for others, you will make sure that the quality of life at the workplace, in the family, in the city, in the transportation, everywhere, you, you will think of the inequalities. So you will be concerned by the quality of life of people. And if you have more consideration for others, then naturally, you cannot ignore the fate of the future generation, no more that you are concerned by the fate of your children and grandchildren. It's just a matter of expanding the circle to generations that you may not know or do not exist yet. But still, all of them, just like you now, they, don't wake up in the mo they will not wake up in the morning thinking, may I suffer the whole day and, if possible, my whole life. They aspire to some kind of well-being. So that, if we value that, then we will have consideration for that. So the question, of course, is does altruism exist as an authentic way of being? Well, there's a lot of discussion about that, but it seems that from all sides, from the science, from the psychology, from philosophy, from all ways, yes, of course, we have that potential deep within. Now, is that enough? Well, the world is not in a totally optimal condition, so. If we have this potential, how, we, how do we nurture it? How do we go about that there's an individual transformation and that there's enough of that individual transformation to have a tipping point so that the culture and society change toward a more cooperative and more altruistic society? So that's the challenge we have, is to find the, the, the connection between individual change and societal change. So first, we must look at individual change. Is it possible? Is it a given that you are more or less altruistic, that you are more or less happy? Of course, there's a genetic component, but that's just like the blueprint. You can change that. Everything in, new, in science since last 20 years has shown that change is possible. Neuroscience in the brain was taught 20 years ago that the brain is fixed when you are an adult. You can't mess around anymore with these few billions of neurons. It's going to wreak havoc in your brain. It's not true. Until our death, we can change. Epigenetics shows that, yes, you get this genetic inheritance, but you can, just like we could switch, decide which light we, need to, we want to switch off and on, you can switch on and off genes. And that comes from behavior. That comes from training. That comes to what you are exposed. And that comes to what you have in mind. Recently, at the lab where I come from, from Richie Davidson, there is a Spanish epigeneticist who shown that after eight hours of meditation on compassion, there's a significant change in the expression of some genes that have to do with the immune system, for instance, just the beginning of a wonderful study. So individual change is possible, and that's what I'm going to try to show. So the idea in the beginning, so can loving kindness and compassion be trained like a skill? Just like, as you know, you learn how to play chess, solve mathematical equations, or juggle, or do gymnastics. 
Can you do that? So it was thought, well, let's try to see first if people who have spent a long time meditating in those very quiet, beautiful places with not much disturbance, has something changed? Are they somehow different when they engage in a specific meditation state? Or are they just like anyone, in which case either they wasted their time or the modern way of investigation cannot show that? So, first of all, we must begin by acknowledging the fact that social bonds is was the most determining factor to quality of life. If you look at the determinants of happiness, you know, basically, Richard Layard from the Action for Happiness in England, he's also from the School of Economics, has shown that basically income only contributes to a few percent of your subjective well-being. What comes most all around the world is social bond. How much friendship do you have? How much affection you have and give in your life? That's the most significant factor for genuine happiness. So those two centenarian ladies, there's an island in Japan where there's the highest rate of centenarians. So a study was done, there's a movie called Happy about that, and where there's long sequence about this island. It shows that from birth to death, they're always together. Those grandmothers, they're all day long playing, dancing, with the, of course there's the grandfathers too, there's a few less of 100 years old, but still there are some. Then those grandmothers, they go at the end of the schools twice a day and the kids run to them, they give them sweets, so they're all together. And they say, it's because we're all together from birth to death that we have this kind of happiness in our community and longevity. So social support is associated with better mental health, less heart disease, greater longevity, less substance abuse, better immunity, less dementia, name it. It has so many wonderful effects of the quality of our life. And it began, of course, with parental care, especially maternal care. That's what we receive through evolution. But from the basis of that, we can use that to extend it to other certain beings, because just like us, they want happiness and they don't want to suffer. So from the basis of that, then also animals, you know, they can be quite kind to each other, even they're not of the same species. Here's a wonderful example. You know, that mother tiger, she, she lost her kids, uh, a little tiger, so they gave her little piglets, and they, she, she felt quite happy about that. <laughs> and here, another good case of friendship. And here, you know, you think that a, a, a small mouse that's going to eat the meat of the leopard is going to end up in a pretty bad way. Not at all. It's just licking it. And, you know, you can have also this kind of good friendship. So that shows that, you know, if chimpanzees and and tigers can have some kind of empathy, why not human beings? <laughs> so we have this potential. So now it's fine to speak about meditators who did 50,000 hours of meditation. What about just two weeks? So this Richard Davison did this study recently with Ellen Wang. She's a wonderful young scientist. And they just had people to practice compassion, loving kindness for two weeks, 30 minutes a day. And then they measure their prosocial tendencies to many ways. And they compare that with a, another quite efficient uh, psychological intervention called reappraisal. And it shows that the compassion meditation, just with novice people for two weeks, it's already changed their prosocial behavior. But more than that, it begins changing function, the function of some areas of the brain, including the amygdala that has to do with the anger, the fear, and what gives rise to aggressivity. So it's already visible in the brain after two weeks of just this simple 30 minutes a day training. So you see, it's not, we don't have to go to this beautiful place in the Himalayas, although you are welcome, but it's something so accessible in a secular way to everyone. And now the real thing was, can we do that with four or five years old preschooler? So the program has been done in Madison. There's a 10-week program. Uh, five weeks is about bringing mindfulness. So there's 30 minutes a day for three days a week in preschool or school in a very difficult area of Madison where 80% of the kids have social problems. So they do the teddy bear breathing, you know, breathing, though the kids lie down and they watch their breath as the teddy bear on their chest is going up and down. They are mindful of their emotions. 
And then another five weeks is about gratitude, uh, working together. If another kid is sad, try to uh, ask the kid to feel what do your friend is feeling now? And what do you think other child's, children in the world are feeling? So this kind of uh, subtle but very simple intervention that four or five years old can easily relate to. And then after 10 weeks, you ask the teachers and also the parents to evaluate the prosocial behavior of those preschoolers. You know, how much do they fight? How much do they help each other? What does their positive effect or negative effect? And they see a quite significant difference. But you might say, well, you know, that's the teacher's ID. Now let's go to a real test. So the ultimate test, the sticker's test. <laughs> that cannot lie. So before starting, you determine who in the class is the best friend for every child. Who is their less favorite child? And then you do, that, you do a test before and after the 10 weeks. So what you do is you give the kids four envelopes. One has the photo of their favorite friends, another one of their less favorite child, then the third one is an unknown child. The fourth one is a sick child, they don't know also, but obviously sick. And they give those stickers that you see down there. Don't, they really like stickers, I tell you. <laughs> so they say, you know, you give the stickers in whichever envelope you like. So not surprisingly, before the intervention, they give all the stickers to their best friend. So the idea was maybe after 10 weeks, there might be a slightly measurable difference. Not just slight. Look, here is on the left, before the intervention, after the intervention, is actually they give the same number to their best friend and their less favorite friends. So you broke completely the in-group, out-group discrimination. That's quite amazing with four or five years old. You know, such a simple thing. So it's almost, I was telling your wonderful mayor, that's such a, it's almost criminal not to do that because it doesn't cost much. So now they are doing that with 200 children in Madison and Arizona said, that's wonderful. Let's do that with 10 schools, 100 schools, 1,000 schools, go to United Nations, whole world. So that's our task. So now, it was this interesting idea. How do you really, you know, Aristotle said that virtue, you don't have to be virtuous to become virtuous. Of course, I mean, if you're already supposed to be what you want to become, that's difficult. So virtue comes by practicing it. So this is an interesting study. It was asked to people to practice five acts of kindness in a week, in five different days. Another group was asked, to practice those five acts of kindness in a single day. And that's all they do for the week. So you do that for a number of weeks, and after that, you measure the positive effect, how people are predisposed to open to others, and also how they feel in terms of positive emotion. And what's very interesting, as you can see, I don't have this laser pointer, but the people who did, only, who did five acts of kindness in one day, once a week, they had a much stronger effect. So that means that, you know, if you have to do five acts of kindness, your whole day really <coughs> changed the kind of feeling that, you, that pervades the whole day is filled with kindness. And that has a much more strong impact on your way of being than just doing casually one act a day like, uh, like a duty. So it really shows that by practicing kindness, then it really gets into your mind stream, into your heart stream, and then you integrate that much better. So that's just the opposite on being self-centered. You know, me, me, me all day long is a very miserable uh, state of mind. And also you make your life miserable to everyone around. So it's a lose-lose situation. While loving kindness and, and compassion, first of all, of course people will feel it in a good way, but also it's something that is the most uh, satisfactory state of mind and is attuned to reality, which is interdependent. You don't think of yourself as a unitary, uh, separate entity. Uh, so there's a psychologist called Tim Kasser. He studied the people who are most self-centered and consumeristic and materialistic, and he took the 25% higher compared to the 25% lower, and he studied over 20 years, 10,000 people, 
And he found that those who are so much self-centered and sort of consumption-oriented, they are much less happy. They are relations, professional relations, but less friends. They are less healthy. They are more obsessed with debt. They are less concerned with global issues. So basically, he said, I'm not a moralist, but if you want to be happy, to have friends, to be concerned by the world, to be in good health, then it's better to have a kind of more appreciation of intrinsic values, like friendship, relations, rather than just betting on improving the material condition alone. So now, again, to come back to the idea of this uh, training. So the idea with long-term practitioner was to show how much difference really can we make to long-term training. So a number of practitioners who were disciples of those great, wonderful spiritual masters, like Dilbo Kensi Rinpoche, or Kanjo Rinpoche, or others, inspired by His Honest the Dalai Lama, who always had a strong connection with science. He really is interested about investigating reality, not just appearance, but what is the real thing happening. So in 2000, after a meeting of that Mind and Life Institute, of which Jim spoke about, that is dedicated to bringing together contemplative and scientists, and which is around his holiness, it was decided that if we want to make a contribution to society in a way that is acceptable all over the world, that means a secular way, we have to have a solid scientific investigation of the benefit of mind training on the body, on the brain, on health, on, on, affect, on affective uh, sort of state of mind. So meditators came to the lab, beginning in Madison, Wisconsin, but now in many labs throughout the world, in Europe as well, in Asia as well. And so you could investigate the brain by studying the EEG that measure very fast changes in the brain, or using the scanner, the fMRI, and Mingyu Rinpoche, who is here, said there's four characteristics to the scanner. It is cold, it is dark, it is narrow, and it is noisy. <laughs> so it's not the best place to meditate. Nevertheless, and this was the first time I came out of two and a half hours in a, in a scanner, and Richard Davidson is pretty relieved that uh, the meditator did survive. <laughs> but what was found really is uh, difference even at the, at, at the level, I think I missed some slide, I will come back to that, so sorry. Where are they, oh no, where? Here they are, so sorry for that. So what turns out of those studies, this is one example of electroencephalogram study. If you look at the bottom part, uh, it's a novice people who did for one week the meditation according to the instruction, and they are asked to stay at rest, that's the, the pink line, and then to engage in compassion meditation, that's the blue line, so nothing must change. Well, they have not been trained, what to do? And then the top one, the bottom line is the meditators when they rest, I mean, they don't do anything special, but when they engage in compassion meditation, you see this incredible increase, especially in the gamma frequency, which has to do with coherence and connectivity in the brain. So it's a huge increase that is triggered by engaging in compassion meditation. If you look at mental imagery, you see uh, the meditators is on the left side. When they are at rest, nothing much happened. And then on meditation, there are several areas of the brain connected with the empathy, with positive effect, with maternal love, and so forth, which are highly light up. And on the right side, you see the control group, people who just try for a week, at rest, nothing happened. Meditation, nothing happened. That's normal. They didn't train. And uh, Jim made allusion of the fact that you can even ask a meditator to modulate the intensity of compassion. Now, what does that mean, 30% of compassion? You think, oh, this guy, I don't like him too much. I'll give him only 30% of my compassion. <laughs> well, it's not that. You know, when you have the feeling coming up in the mind or in the heart, whatever, no, it's coming, it's just taking birth, and then it becomes stronger and stronger. So you could modulate that, just let it be, and then make it grow. So if you do that subjectively, and you measure, and that was 22 hours in MRI machine in Maastricht, so like a marathon fMRI over three days. So the aggregation of all that showed that the subjective feeling of 30% of compassion, 60 or 90%, actually correspond to what was measured. So there's a kind of flexibility in generating those states at will. That shows the kind of training. 
So likewise, without attention, you can't train in anything. You're supposed to train or meditate on compassion, but if your mind is distracted, nothing will happen. So it was also shown that with experienced meditator, the attention curve, you know, as you see on the top, is non-trained people. They lose attention very fast if you give them a precise task, while the bottom graph, trained meditators, the attention remains perfect. And we went up to 45 minutes, and you have to reply to a, 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 a test or a, a kind of a trigger a thousand times, one, three times per second, uh, yes or no, there's some kind, something to do. And they make zero mistake, 100% accuracy over 45 minutes. And one of them, the one which is on the right here, at the end he says, what's the problem? You want me to continue? He was ready to go for the whole day. So what does that show? Someone who does things with ease and perfectly. That's exactly what a skill is about. You know, when you start riding a bicycle, you are very nervous, you don't do it well, and you're sort of uh, fritting around. But if you, if you are experienced, then you can lift your hands and sing, and nothing happens. So now, so that means it's possible to change as a person. Now, what's wonderful is the last 20 years, studies about the evolution of culture, how human culture, which is cumulative from generation to generation, can change in a Darwinian way, but much faster than genes. So that's our luck, because we don't have much time to wait to have a more cooperative and altruistic society. We need it very soon. So the combination of individual change and culture change is like two blades of a knife that are sharpening each other. Individual change, they make the culture change. Next generation change even more. So we could really go, there are models that have been made, we could really go to a, we need to go now to a new step of cooperation. There's a wonderful book called Super Cooperators by Martin Novak from Harvard, who showed that actually, as Jim said, cooperation was much more important in evolution for going a new step forward in creativity than competition. So that now we are at a stage, we need another step of cooperation. Why? Because we are at the edge of the precipice. What precipice? Planet boundaries. This is what a planet boundary is. There are nine planet boundaries that were defined by Joan Rockstrom and a few other uh, ecologist authors. This is the, the boundary inside this boundary is the place of safety in which humanity can thrive. The Holocene is a 12,000 years period where the climate has been pretty stable and that allowed civilization to thrive. Before, there was too much variation from glaciation to heat and it was very difficult. You know, 12,000 years ago, there was one to two million human beings on Earth. And that was because of the conditions were not favorable. So we had this exceptional period, and that could go on, provided we stay within that boundary of safety with different climate change, ozone. So all those are interconnected, in fact, but they can be measured. So in 1900, there was no danger at all. Now, in 1950, came what we call the Anthropocene, the time where human activities start to have a major, major impact on the planet to extend that we could call it a new geological area. So you can see that some of the components of climate change, nitrogen flow, and the use of uh, agricultural land and biodiversity is starting to get a little bit on the edge. So now guess what comes next, 2010. Hold your breath, here we are. So, so good for people to say that nothing happened. So now we are, so the zone of safety means we don't know exactly where is the tipping point after which it's irreversible. We don't know. It's like driving in the dark near a waterfall like you saw, not knowing exactly where it is, but you know that now I'm quite near, so I better slow down. So that's what means a planet boundary. So now, it's obvious, many things happened in 1950. The great acceleration in water use, damming the rivers, fertilizer consumption, name it. You know, just, uh, I don't need to repeat those, I just flash them because they all go in the same direction. There's a huge increase and because of overconsumption, basically. So that's what means the Anthropocene. So we must do something for that, and the only way is to increase cooperation 
and not, not even sustainable growth. What we need is sustainable harmony. Sustainable harmony means that we need first to take care of 1.4 billion people who are in, still in terrible poverty, and we need to stop this crazy overconsumption at the top. So harmony means a more balanced soci human society where those who are in need have enough to feed their children and those who consume too much think twice. Because anyway, it's not going to work. At that speed, in 2050, we will need three planets if we continue at that speed. If the ch every Chinese person, I mean, if the number of vehicles per habitant in China is the same level that the United States, China would need the whole oil reserve for the whole year. So that doesn't work. The maths don't add. So we have to do something. And to look for uh, what, for instance, the Kingdom of Bhutan, which is pretty surprising to come from there, this idea of a triple indicators. Prosperity, we need what we need to have a good life. At the same time, we need to take care of, of human flourishing. At the same time, we need to take care of the environment for future generation. So we need to balance that. We need to count social wealth and natural wealth as a plus, not only the GDP. You know, if lots of people are sick because they smoke tobacco, the GDP goes up. You know, tobacco company make money and the hospital make money, so it's a plus. But if you look at social well-being, of course it's a minus. So there's a new way of doing national accounting. And there's all this new movement. There's been a resolution at the United Nations put by Bhutan and voted by the whole of the vast majority of country to put well-being as the 10 goal of the Millennium Plan. So that's the overview of why we need altruism now, not as a luxury, but as a necessity. And the good news is we can change as individuals and society can change, so that's the good. So that's basically, and one way to, to, to change very fast is it turns out that the second major factor to global warming is, comes from industrial farming. Because, you know, all the scattered, they fart and, and all these things. There's a lot of methane that has a terrible effect on the atmosphere. Ten, 20 times more than carbon di dioxide. So we could easily reduce by reducing this crazy, you know, billions and billions of animals just for increasing meat consumption. It's also a problem of ethics because if you make one kilo of meat, you need 10 kilos of vegetable protein that the poorest nation could eat. We could support 1.4 billion poor people with the 775 million tons of soy and corn that is used just to uh, livestock. If you look at the United States, there's about 120 kg of meat per habitant per year. In India, it's only 2.5, and they are doing pretty well otherwise. So as ben George Bernard Shaw said, <laughs> animals are my friend. I don't eat my friend. That's the fastest way to remedy to climate change. It takes five seconds, eat less meat, and that's done. So just to conclude, compassion in action, as I said in the beginning, it's nice to start in a hermitage, but we need to put it in action. So from our humble way, we tried over the years to do 120 projects in the Himalayas, in Tibet, Nepal, India. We build a number of clinics, and we go in villages, and uh, we have uh, treated about 100,000 patients a year. We build school with bamboos. Here's the first bamboo college in the world with 2,000 kids, all made in bamboo for $100,000. That's hard to beat. And 60% girls. So that's one good thing. And then we build 20 clinics in eastern Tibet. So it's not just to show off, but so that, you know, with some kind of determination, things is possible. And if everyone puts a drop in the ocean, oh, it seems we need a bridge, so we build 18 bridges in Tibet. We take care of the elderly. He's the happiest man in the world. <laughs> he has a Tibetan doctor who is not an ophthalmologist nor a dentist. <laughs> and he has a little... So that's some of the schools that we build. So, it's a great joy, of course, to be at the service of others. But as I said in the beginning, unless you grow that motivation in, in, the, in the beginning, it's very difficult to keep on going because there will be all sorts of things that will distract you, that will discourage you. So to keep with that strong, compassionate courage, you need to grow that within yourself. And then, slowly, you can start serving others. So that's what I wanted to share with you. 
we also intervene in earthquake areas. We are going to build an earthquake resistance school at 12,000 feet. And so, so basically, for those who are interested, that's our website. And so, compassion in action, beginning with the heart and extending the heart to everyone. So, thank you. Thank you both for such beautiful presentations. And I also want to just let people know that we started a little bit late, and luckily there's not another presentation after this. So we're going to be able to continue the conversation through the hour. Of course, we understand if there's other obligations. But we, we will continue talking. Um, I'll begin with a few questions, and then I look forward to hearing from all the questions out in the audience as well. Uh, Matthew, just to start with you, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, but you were trained as a scientist, you received a PhD in your 20s, and that was the path you had intended on taking. Then you became a monk as you traveled up into the Himalayas. I'm, I'm curious, when you began to become interested in Buddhism and meditation, did you have any intuitions at the time that there were going to be these tremendous discoveries that linked meditation and science? Well, really not at all. In those days, you know, I went first to India to meet those great teachers in 1967. I think there was no MRI machine at that time for sure. And, uh, and then in 72, I left for good. So I had 25 years there without really much contact with the Western world. I, I hardly read a, a page in French or English. I only was concentrating on the learning Tibetan and practicing. So I thought, you know, I had a wonderful time in science. And it gave me the, the strong sort of uh, inclination to uh, rigorous investigation of reality. Not, not, no, 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 I can't stand this sort of sloppy approach. In a way, no, I think what I learned from science is a rigorous mind. So that's, uh, I'm very grateful for my science teacher to have infused that little bit in my mind. But I never even dreamt that I would ever come back to science. That was it for me. And then it just happened thanks to those, this mind that left meeting and his holiness being so interested. And when that first meeting I participated in on destructive emotion, when his holiness halfway to the week of the discussion, he said, that's all fine, but what can we contribute to society? Yeah. And then the scientists got together at lunchtime and we discussed and they said, well, let's start a serious research program. And since you know, I've been interested in science, I raised my hand stupidly, say, oh, I'll come. So I became the flying guinea pig and I must have spent 100 hours in MRI machines. So yeah. that's where I am now. But it's interesting that you said this idea of a rigorous practice, because Tibetan Buddhism has this real focus on logic a lot of the time, and a very strict meditation practices as well. So does it lend itself towards a scientific brain? Well, you see, what I call science is a, a genuine investigation of reality, you know, not just blind faith, blind belief. But so contemplative science is a science. You know, it's the science of of the mechanism of happiness and suffering, how does your mind work, how do you investigate the deep nature of mind, is empirical. And it, it, you know, if people say, oh, it's very good to have a strong ego, I say, great, you know, spend a whole weekend thinking me, me, me all day long. Or, you know, jealousy makes a colorful life, fantastic, you know, do it for 24 hours, just jealousy, jealousy, and see how you feel at the end. If you feel good, go for it. Now, who would come for a weekend for tra increasing jealousy? Guaranteed 100%. Nobody. Now, if you say, I will increase loving kindness, that people think, wow, that's a wonderful. Right. So we know that. So that's really empirical. What mental state and con emotions and will conduce to flourishing, will conduce to be more open and, and loving to others, and which one will just undermine your happiness and that of others? So that's a kind of science. It's investigation. James, I want to bring you in here uh, and to talk about some of the research. Um, a lot of people, to get the effects that you're talking about for meditation, will take other means. A lot of people talk about uh, Western culture, American culture, being an over-medicated society right now as well. The introduction of, of Ritalin or the introduction of antidepressants to try and create the same effects. I was wondering if you could talk about the brain versus meditation versus when we try and get there through other means. What are the difference? What do they say? Well, I, I guess the key is when you say get there, yeah. what is it that you're talking about? 
you know, on the one hand is the sense of flourishing and the sense of uh, being at your best. And as we've been discussing, that really connects with serving others. <clears throat> but there's potentially another part of this which you could call transcendence, which is this sense of uh, who am I in this world? What is my purpose? Is there a purpose? Uh, am I contributing to that purpose? And that's more of a, a deeper question. Uh, I don't, I think that there is every bit of evidence that, as you said, we are over-medicated, and the reality is, why are we over-medicated? Well, because we have a uh, pharmaceutical industrial complex that has no interest in us uh, helping ourselves without pharmaceuticals, right? I mean, that's reality. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there is every bit of evidence that for and I, I, don't get me wrong, I am not denying that in certain medical conditions, pharmaceuticals play an extraordinary role. That being said, though, as an example, with a number of types of depression, it's been shown with simple types of meditative practice that you can overcome that because what happens oftentimes with, with depression, as an example, is you have this, uh, actually you close off from others, you go inside yourself and you have this self-rumination about uh, you know, how bad you are versus if you get engaged with others, you see that others are suffering like you, you see others have the same problems, and you engage with them and help them, you see actually you have a purpose, you're not worthless, and for many people that brings them out and helps them overcome this. But again, I'm not trying to imply that there's not a place for pharmaceuticals. Yeah. This is to both of you. Um, there is even NPR had a study recently that said they looked at the brains of people that had been engaged in criminal activities or in prison, and you spoke of this a little bit. I'd like to hear what you think about the, do you believe that meditation alone for those brains, alone, is something to really completely reconstitute the brain? Is it that powerful? To what? To change the brain, to uh, bring it more into a compassionate state when we're looking at brains that have been very severely altered, say, that have been in prison or other situations or very traumatic upbringings. I guess I'll say something. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. There is now a body of evidence that demonstrates that uh, sociopaths actually have abnormal brains. This connection between, it's not that they're not intelligent, it's not that they don't perceive pain, it's just they don't respond to it or it has no effect on them. Because if you and I were to see somebody suffering, there's probably one or two sociopaths, so I'll exclude you in this room, but, and I'm not talking about just the bankers or the law, no. Uh, 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 <laughs> if, if, if we see somebody suffering, it hurts us. I mean, you know, if you see a horrible event occurring, uh, you want to turn your head away or you want to do something. But for this group of people, it has absolutely no emotional impact on them. And you can see actually in children as young as four and five with a fair degree of specificity, which of those children actually have the potential to become sociopaths because they actually have uh, actually a, a abnormal brain. In that group of people, you cannot do an intervention. But I think, and this has been demonstrated with a variety of projects involving meditation and other uh, projects in prisons where you can engage people to actually recognize they have value, to bring their dignity back, to give them self-respect. And when you do it that way, you can see immense flourishing okay from people who, in some senses, have been forgotten. You see, I think we should uh, possibly clarify or demystify even what meditation means. So when you say, can we use meditation for people who have sort of brain damage or abnormality or psychopaths, it doesn't mean just sitting there, okay, you just sit there and watch your breath and all that. Meditation means training the mind. And their problem is the problem that comes from the mind, the fact that they have no empathy at all. Uh, I just uh, discussed with the, one of the best specialists of psychopaths in medicine, Michael Campbell. He said, some of them, they don't make a difference between a human being and a handkerchief. I mean, they just see as an instrument, the other. So there is a difficulty, and we often come from early childhood, or even genetic, just to simply resonate with the suffering of others. So therefore, you know, they, they don't care, basically. But, so mind training uh, is, uh, is the real meaning of meditation. Actually, the Sanskrit word, bhavana, means to cultivate. Cultivate a skill with your mind. 
And then the, sense, the Tibetan words, gom, means to become familiar with the new way of being. So becoming familiar with the new way of being is exactly the only successful intervention with psychopath has been precisely to slowly rehumanize their relation with their warders, with themselves. And there had been some extent of success. Uh, the only intervention was precisely done in medicine. And dramatic, actually, success. You know, they took uh, young offenders, uh, psychopaths, uh, in their 20s, and a group of 200. And then after their time, they had to release them. And the control group of 200, within four years, there were 18 murders. Don't we had this intervention of rehumanizing them and breaking the kind of punishment revenge cycle, there was zero uh, murder committed by that group. Mm. So that's a kind of mind training because it has to do with human emotions and changing what you are. So basically, uh, it's meditation, but without this kind of exotic word, it's mind training, changing your mind. Yeah. Now, was that with uh, MRI? Because I, I not, not no, it, yeah. it was a be, sort of behavior. Yeah, thing. because I think you have to be careful how you're defining a psychopath. Also, no, but they also work with can yeah. kill who actually yeah. see the brain of, yeah. of psychopath. They, they brought they have, so they cannot bring the, the MRI to the to the jail, but they have a truck and they bring the people <laughs> in the truck in the jail to measure the the brain activity. Well, let me ask one more question here. I, I'm I'm really interested in thinking about this in terms of of a spiritual practice, which is where this came from with you, Matthew. And is there ever a fear, do you think, of turning uh, Tibetan Buddhist practice and making it very scientific, removing some level of, 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 of spirit, removing some level of a mystery to what this is and a reason why a lot of us will turn to a practice? Or do you think that this is all positive? You see, it's all about the question of overlap. I mean, you will hear, I hope all of you, I'm sure all of you, <laughs> that'll be a pity if you are not there when he's on his teaches in a few days. He clearly says within Buddhism there is a three parts. It's what he called Buddhist science, which is just investigation of reality, investigation of the mind, investigating of emotion. And he says if something is true there, it's true for everyone. If something is false there, it's false for everyone. Mm -hmm. Now, if a Japanese scientist found a new elementary particle, the particle doesn't become Japanese. It's there or it's not there. So that's the same thing. Then they said there's Buddhist philosophy about the worldview, and then Buddhist practice, and they said that's Buddhist business. So the overlap is in the Buddhist science, the investi empirical investigation. And that is where we have this collaboration with neuroscience, with psychology, with uh, even e economists, and with all kinds of uh, works of life relevant to modern society. So now, in those collaborations, we don't bring up the question of what is the ultimate nature of consciousness, mm -hmm. although there's wonderful discussion uh, taking place, you know, besides outside the lab with those very scientists about the nature of consciousness, but we cannot bring that in the MRI machine. So that dimension is completely intact, and simply there is an overlap of certain common uh, pursuits which can contribute to society, and that's what we need to, we, to continue, respecting the other dimensions that are present in each other's uh, discipline. Yeah. Well, let's open up the questions to the audience here. We have m different microphones going around, a couple of microphones. So looking forward to questions. Let's start right here. I really appreciated what all you've said but you spoke to something that's very dear to my heart. Um, it's easy for me to be compassionate to those who suffer and those who uh, <coughs> one could consider our soulmates, but I'm very involved in conservation, rhinoceros con conservation, for example. How can I learn to be compassionate for the poachers, the illegal loggers, those are the ones that it's hard to have any good feelings about at all. And, and the, the ones that are just trying to do it for subsistence, that's one thing. But the greed, the money, the destruction for profit, gain. Shall I begin? Well, I think here this very uh, wonderful point to be made that this makes all the time. 
Actually, those are the ideal object of our compassion, not just out of sort of, uh, how do you say, being soft on what's wrong in this world. But you see, compassion is not like, uh, is not a, a reward for good behavior, and withdrawing compassion is, cannot be a punishment for bad behavior. It's completely something else. You know, judge, moral judgment, of course, exists, and we can find some conduct absolutely despicable. But compassion is different. Compassion goes at the root of any suffering, wherever it is, whatever are its form. So those people are creating immense suffering. So even more, a bloody dictator does. So instead, so to have compassion or to even altruistic love in a certain way is not to like them, to like what they do. It's not wishing them good and success and say, oh, that's not too bad, don't worry. Here is a, just go for holiday on the, on, the, on the Bahamas, here is a plane ticket. It's not that at all. It's like a, a physician, a doctor, who has a, a, a mad patient. The more the patient is sick, the more the doctor will be concerned by giving the right medication. And that medication is compassion. And the Buddha said, if hatred replies to hatred, it will never cease. And Gandhi said, if, you know, if we do eye for eye, tooth for tooth, the, the world will, should be blind and toothless. So <laughs> the more there is, you know, what, what better can you wish to a poacher that he becomes concerned by, by the animals? The, the, what can more you wish to a dictator that the hatred, the cruelty, the indifference, that he, or the greed that in, in his mind goes away? So that's what compassion wishes. And that was the goal of trying to somehow transform others. It's not just approving what they do, but seeing the sickness is very serious, so let's find the right medicine. It doesn't mean to, be, to just let things be, happen. You can use the appropriate means, but not with anger, not with hatred, but with compassion. Other question? Um, yes. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you probably are familiar, uh, Dr. Doty, of uh, Eben Alexander's uh, book from last year. Uh, he's a fellow neurosurgeon. Uh, I'm an uh, experienced trained physician myself. I was intrigued, not by the title or, or that particular content, but I was very interested in the fact that um, in this experience that he had, um, his cerebral cortex essentially invaded by E. coli, and he was in a comatose state for like a week before he finally came out of that, which is extremely unusual. Um, I'm just curious in his description. Uh, what intrigued me the most was the very core of his experience came up with compassion and love. And I was just wondering if you have had any experience with those kinds of conditions uh, and have done any studies in that regard. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> uh, actually, it's interesting. I, I, I'm certainly aware of Eben and uh, uh, that book. And for those who may not know, what is it called? Something about heaven. There, proof of heaven. Uh, it's interesting. There's a growing body of literature on near-death experiences, and I know that's not the topic of why we're here. Uh, and in fact, in many ways, they're very consistent. And the other aspect is they're often oriented towards that particular person's culture. As an example, if you're Christian, you may see God or Jesus or angels. I will tell you a story from my own personal experience, my own dear death, death experience where I was out with some colleagues and actually we ran into a tree, or my friend ran us into a tree. And uh, I was the only one wearing a seatbelt. I had a, a splenic fracture, transected small bowel. A back fracture was paralyzed, lost bowel and bladder function. And they took me to surgery. <clears throat> and they missed a bleeder, and then I came back to the uh, intensive care unit and bled out into my belly and left my body, watched this event happening, then went to surgery, and then in fact had this experience where uh, I was going down a river, which is common, or, or something like that. You see this light at the end, which is actually, and I'll tell you from my own personal experience, it's like you're enveloped in love, and as you get closer and closer and go more rapidly towards this light, it's this incredible sense of serenity and connectedness and desire and love to be with that. Now, in my case, there was no Jesus there. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, and then you, I heard all these loved ones who had passed talking to me. And in fact, during this process, 
uh, I was uh, uh, reliving my life. Uh, uh, so it did happen, uh, but I didn't write a book about it. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> But, you know, I don't know what that is. Uh, you know, there are explanations that it's uh, either a, a, a large uh, neuronal sort of uh, release of energy, and that's the explanation, or is it hypoxia? I don't think anyone knows, and I don't know what it means. You know, people ask me, geez, you had that experience. Obviously, that's the thing that, that has taken you on this path, and honestly, it's not at all. Uh, in fact, I still don't know what that meant, but sometimes there are experiences and events that happen in our lives that cannot be explained, and we just have to accept that they occurred and then live with that and incorporate those. But uh, so from a personal experience, I know they happened because it happened to me, and it's very consistent with what's happened to other people. But did that reinforce a belief in God or somehow make me think that there's a heaven? Uh, no. Let's go over on this side. Some. Thank you. We'll go in the, in the back there if we can get the microphone. Oh, is there one up front? Okay. That's one. Good morning. Thank you for your very insightful presentations. Um, so I noticed several layers to the compassion conversation. One layer is that compassion is good for us, so therefore we should practice it. A deeper layer, um, compassion uh, has driven development over time. It, it gives us advantages, and it's persisted over, over, over disadvantages. And, and the deeper layer that I have a question about is the question of um, um, essential nature. And, and this might be a question for uh, Mathieu Ricard, uh, uh, specifically the Buddha nature. And every tradition has this term for essential nature as being incorruptible, something that cannot be augmented or, um, or damaged. So how do you reconcile this sense of being that we have this incorruptible essential nature with the model that says that we were primitive and we then become more advanced in time? How does something profound as the intrinsic nature of being, um, wouldn't it give birth to something equally profound? So uh, uh, because the sound is not so clear, you mean how would compassion arise from that Buddha nature? That's what you mean? Um, well, uh, taking a step back, so compassion is an effect of the Buddha nature, and, but the Buddha nature itself, um, what kind of a being would it give rise to? What kind of what? How do we, how do we move here. from, how do we move from, um, um, so, you know, the, the, the Darwinian uh, uh, model of the origin of species. So this is a question because, you know, we're here in an audience at this festival of faiths and we have all these religions represented who actually have a very, you know, in many cases, different view of, of the human, um, uh, the origin of, of life. So um, specifically from the Buddhist perspective, how do you reconcile this you know, you have this Buddha nature, shouldn't it give rise to life as profound, you know, right at the starting gate? Um, well, anyway, I will try something. I'm so sorry that I'm not completely sure because of my hearing. But um, the relation at least between what we call the Buddha nature, which is uh, basically a mind that is entirely free from obscurations in the sense of uh, mis uh, distorting reality and uh, also be free from afflictive mental states like uh, hatred, craving, and so forth, and mental delusion. So that is a state of freedom. So once you are free from those, uh, say, obscuring mental states, and then uh, in terms, so basically there's an expense of, of clarity, of of wisdom, of uh, simplicity. And whenever something comes out of that, it can only arise as something that will be, that will be perceived as beneficial to others because it, it cannot be uh, what is uh, free from those uh, mental poisons cannot arise as something that will have a destructive and negative effect. So that's why it says that uh, someone who has fully realized that with their nature Everything 
that comes in that arises in that person's mind, expressing that in those person's speech, or expressing the person's activities, can only naturally be uh, uh, as, as a benefit to others because the source is free from those negative uh, sort of mental states. So I hope it addresses your question. I'm sorry if I didn't hear properly. Let's take another question. Um. I would like uh, to pose a question, please. I was certainly stricken uh, by uh, your comment, uh, Matthew Ricard, on sustainable harmony. And I would love to hear more about that. I'm sure that uh, the Buddhists with whom you're associated have achieved a sustainable harmony in their lives. We need to achieve this in our society. And I would love to hear a little more from you uh, and Dr. Doty as well, if he has anything to say about it, because that strikes me as uh, perhaps the most important thing that we can direct our efforts toward to try to achieve in our society a more sustainable harmony. So of course it's a, it's a quite uh, d complex uh, issue, as you can imagine. So as we said, on a personal level, it's a kind of uh, sense of contentment and simplicity. You know, Henry Toro says, simplify, simplify, simplify. So if we book a Buddhist commentary on that, you will say, simplify your thoughts, simplify your speech, simplify your activities. So it's, and we say in Buddhism that to have, to have a sense of contentment it's like having a treasure in the palm of your hand, because if you're never satisfied, the more you have, you still never have enough. And the whole heart will not be enough. As Gandhi said, there's enough for everyone's need, there's not enough for anyone's greed. So that sense of voluntary simplicity and this perfect happiness, you don't have to feel that you are diminishing yourself. Now, on the global level, of course, which what matters, uh, all those who have studied this uh, the, the dilemma that we are facing said, Either way, to continue with limited growth is impossible. It just cannot be. But also to reduce suddenly growth will affect mostly the poorest populations because then the price of commodities will flare up and they will have even a more difficult time. So in that sense, the middle way is to look for a sustainable harmony means how we can strike a balance, what needs to be done to harmonize those extremes of extreme poverty and overconsumption that, that makes, causes the problem. So it will be to address the needs of the poorest, I mean, reduce inequality, and make sure that uh, eradicate poverty, which is one of the millennium goals, and there's still 1.5 billion people on Earth which are below the line of total poverty. And then, since we know already that this rate of consumption is simply not possible, not whether we like it or not, whether we think that we, you know, we are a society of consumerism or not, too bad. You know, we, we cannot have three planets. That's just like a kid that wants what is not possible. So since this is the case, and since it is too easy to say if it happens in, 40, in 50 years, come back in 49 years, we'll find out. So we need to think seriously about how to balance those and simply be more mindful about this uh, senseless uh, sense of consumption of natural resources and whatever we do, at the same time addressing the... Uh, so that's why harmony in the sense of a more harmonious society with less discrepancy, with more justice, more equality. And it doesn't mean taking from the rich to give to the poor. That doesn't work and it's too easy. It's more finding a more balanced way of approaching the challenges of the future and, and being, and compassion is the root of that because if you have compassion, you will care for the, those who are in needs now and you will care for future generation, even <coughs> physically, obviously they are not here. So people who say, well, people who are not born have no rights because they don't exist, they cannot claim those rights, there's no reciprocity, it's like what Groucho Marx was saying in short. So of course they will exist and even they have no rights in legal terms, if we have compassion, we cannot but think of their fate. 
<clears throat> in, in a few words, but you know, this can be expanded. It's a vast subject, and it's a very difficult subject. What balance to strike between growth and, and decreasing the speed of growth? That's a very complicated subject, and it's not easy to solve. You know, th there's this uh, Tibetan philosophy about the hungry ghost, you know, where there's this thing with this small throat that's trying to put sustenance in there, but it can never get enough down. And in some ways, that's a metaphor for conspicuous consumption society. I mean, what's fascinating is you look at the third world, and there's so many people from the third world who want to come to the first world. And if any of you have been to the third world, you'll see that if, so, if uh, a family or an individual has security, uh, food, and shelter, they're ecstatically happy in many of these places. Yet, so many of them want to come here. And what do we have here in our society? And remember, we are a society of 300 million people that consume 25% of the world's resources. Yet, we are a society of which we have an epidemic of isolation, depression, and loneliness. One quarter of people in America will tell you that they do not feel that they have a person that they feel comfortable with sharing their pain and suffering. This is not an ideal place, unfortunately. And you know these, these people in the third world where, frankly, they have some of the wisest, deepest uh, uh, spiritual traditions and, and wisdom, yet they want to come here where, frankly, in some ways, we're lost. And I think if we take a moment to look and, and in some ways what we've been talking about based on science, some of these practices that have been so beneficial and so helpful to these societies and incorporate them into our societies, we will be able to find a much greater and deeper sense of happiness and contentment and ultimately realize it's not about the acquisition of things because things cannot feel, fuel the hunger which we have. And that hunger ultimately is this connection and desire to be with others. It looks like we should we go to the back there. Yeah. Well, thank you both for your bringing your insights uh, to us. Uh, I have a question for both of you. You have touched on what the neuroscience of compassion can bring to the rescue or the help of individuals who have fallen into the, I guess, let's say the dark side, insensitive to suffering, cruelty, um, even homicide, such as the prison populations. What does the neuroscience of compassion say about large groups, hate groups, nations during uh, their dark periods, even multinational groups that have gone to the dark side of humanity? You know, <clears throat> I grew up in poverty, and uh, uh, I tell the story that my family was on public assistance, my father was an alcoholic, and my mother was an invalid, <clears throat> and I used to, uh, look at individuals who had means and who uh, a position to help others, and they wouldn't help others. And then you'd see people who had every ability to help others, and they would give everything, and they had nothing. And you know, the people who I saw who didn't intervene, if you will, or people who were cruel or, or, or mean, and this is analogous to your statement, you know, I never felt anger or pity towards them because fundamentally these people, these groups you're talking about, they have immense, immense pain that they're, they're suffering. They're manifesting that pain through their actions, but ultimately it is a manifestation of deep pain. You know, I give a talk sometimes that talks about wounds of the heart. You know, all of us have, have these wounds to our heart, and for most of us, they're superficial and they heal quickly but some of them are very, very deep and they continue to cause pain throughout an individual's lives. And as long as they hold that pain, they can never be whole, they can never be cured, and they're, because they don't know to, how to manifest it in a helpful way, that pain is such that then they manifest it in a very negative way, which is the way you desire. And that is not necessarily just an individual, it can be, as you were talking about, larger groups, larger organizations, even countries. Uh, there is a path, but again, you know, you cannot expect, and, I, and the, His Holiness will say, you know, suffering in the world is not going to be uh, completely ever relieved, but each of us can do our part. 
what happens though, people then say, well, geez, it's so overwhelming, I feel like I, I can't do anything. But you know, there's an African proverb and it talks about a fire in the forest and, it, and uh, the fire is burning and all the animals of the forest, large animals of the forest have uh, left and they're just watching the fire burn, they're not doing anything. And they look up and there's this hummingbird and the hummingbird is repeatedly going to this pond and taking a drop of water and dropping it on the fire. <clears throat> and the animals are all sitting there watching and they go, why are you wasting your time? You know, you're just a hummingbird, you're putting it, it's not gonna have any effect on fire. And the hummingbird says, well, I'm doing what I can do. And I think that's all each of us can do is what we can do. Anything you wanna add? Yeah, I didn't hear about the question, sorry. Let's take, I, let's take another okay. question right, right over here. As you know, American culture is intensely individualistic. And I think a lot of us hear this message about meditation is good for you. And we think, well, I sit in my room and I'll meditate half an hour a day and my problems will be solved. Would you talk some about the importance of communities of practice as opposed to individually trying to practice? Well, um, communities, of course, um, as, as we said throughout this um, morning, uh, is essential. Human the quality of human relationship is the, mo the single most important factor of, of well-being. And especially on the spiritual path, the sense of uh, having companions along the path is, is so important so that, you know, first of all, you can share experience, you can help each other as like a, a group of people traveling through a, a dangerous forest and the fact of being together is, uh, is very helpful. And also there's a kind of synergy. We, there's a saying in, in the Tibetan literature, if you take, you know, they make these brooms with so-called kusha grass, it's like kind of a long piece of blades of grass. So if you have 100 of those pieces of grass and you try to broom, if they are separate, you won't achieve anything. If you bring them together, then you have a broom and you can do something. So the fact of uh, being together is something more than just the sum of each individual. And so that's very important. And so that's why there is the sense of communities that I think very, uh, very useful, both to share experience and also to learn from those who have more experience than you. So ultimately spiritual teacher, but even spiritual friends who have somehow a little more experience. So I think, yes, of course, it's very important. In the practice, you have to do it yourself. No one can throw you you know, to enlightenment, like you throw a stone on top of a, of a roof. But the support and showing the way and helping along the way, that's very crucial, yes. Well, I just want to, I think we are, we're over here. This has been so fantastic, and I know that there's a lot going on today, and there's a few other quick housekeeping items I want to take care of. I want to remind everybody here that um, from 1 to 2.30 p.m., Sacred Silence from the Jewish Perspective is happening. That's in the Gauls House, uh, Ballroom C. Also, uh, from 3 to 5.30, Sacred Silence and Sufism and the Vedanta, two great programs coming up this afternoon as well. Also, Mathieu will be signing books right after this outside. Some great stuff, so I hope that you'll join him for that. And to continue, to continue the tradition, uh, can we please end with three minutes of silence? So, in the same way that in the beginning, um, I think it, will, it was useful to see how from this place of silence and simplicity, love and compassion can arise. And now we spend some time together. We exchange some uh, ideas on things that really profoundly matters to our life, to society, to future generation. So in order to, that this has a fruit, it, it should continue. It's, it's not like something that's like a snowflake falling on hot stone that vanishes into thin hair. But we should make so that it is like a snowflake falling into big lake, it will remain. So for that, during those three minutes of silence, let's make a deep aspiration that whatever goodness we generated individually and collectively through this being together. May that be dedicated so that this continues to be a fruit. And as long as we are here, it may help to both uh, accomplish something in our own life and be, and be able to serve 
society and the world in a better way. <laughs>